We are in week number six of our sermon series, What If God Treated? And we are looking at the letters of Jesus to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Uh, Jesus wrote these uh, letters uh, to, uh, through the prophet uh, John or the apostle John uh, when he showed up to, uh, you know, and, and gave him a revelation um, when he was at the island of Patmos. And uh, one of the reasons why, for those of you who might not have been here before as we began this sermon series, uh, one of the reasons why we have been using social media as, um, as, as a playoff of, of this sermon is because, you know, in those days they used letters, but in this day and age, uh, if Jesus was giving the revelation all over again, he would actually use uh, social media. I, I believe with everything in me that that's what he would do. Uh, because that's what we use today. I mean, we've gotten to the place where I can't even remember uh, the last time I wrote a letter and put it in the post office box and sent. You know, there, there are still some places where we are taking letters, but those, those, those are where? Government offices. Because these days, even the bank will tell you, send us an email. You know? Or you do a letter and you attach it on email and you send. Uh, it was so interesting. I was dealing with uh, uh, you know, somebody the other day, and they actually uh, told me, you, you know, you don't need to email me. Just send it on WhatsApp. I was like, hmm. Okay. So that has become official now. You know? And so I believe that Jesus um, might have just asked John, you know, go ahead and WhatsApp the people. Okay? Go ahead and WhatsApp the people. And it's interesting that these messages were delivered through, uh, you, you know, what the Bible calls uh, in some versions, the, the angel of the church. The angel of the church at Sardis, the angel of the church at Smyrna, the angel of the church at Pergamon. But uh, when you look at the meaning of, of, of the word translated as angel in, uh, uh, in, in the Greek, uh, because uh, the New Testament was written in Greek, the word there can actually be translated messenger. Uh, are you getting me? Mm -hmm. Another meaning of that word is not just messenger, but servant. To the servant of the church. And um, the, the, the understanding, uh, if, if you were to sit down and do a, a, a research on this on church history, and uh, even check out uh, uh, from the basis of the words used and the way that they are used, this was not a heavenly uh, being, because why did Jesus then need John? Uh, to write to this messenger uh, who was uh, in Sardis or Pergamon or, or Ephesus. Because Jesus would have simply said that the, 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 the angel directly himself. And so it was talking about uh, the leaders of these churches, if I would uh, put it that way. I don't want to say pastors of, of the churches, but really the leaders of the church, the people that were leaders of, of these churches, because they were the servants who are serving this church. Uh, or who are uh, serving the churches. And uh, so it's important for us uh, to uh, just be able to note that. Now, ha having uh, said that, if you would like to uh, get a hold of the five other sermons apart from today, you can actually be able to do that. You can get that on uh, our YouTube channel. You simply uh, go and uh, search for at ICC Mombasa and you'll be able to get a full uh, sermon in there. And if you want the full service, uh, you can be able to get that on Facebook. Uh, you still search for at ICC Mombasa uh, because um, normally we stream our uh, service uh, 10 a.m. Um, you know, to about... Um, 10 a.m. to about 12 every uh, Sunday. We have been streaming that. And uh, beginning on the 3rd of November, we want to change the timings of our service stream uh, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. as uh, we just uh, study uh, people's dynamics and uh, the times when they get onto social media and all because we want to reach people. We don't want just to do uh, what is traditional. We want to be able to reach and impact people. And so uh, we'll, beginning on the 3rd of November, we'll begin streaming our service at 10, uh, I mean at 12 p.m. and not at 10 a.m. And uh, I believe that uh, those who are following us can get that timing uh, in there. We'll be able to minister to more people that way. Um, when I was 12 years of age, uh, let me just tell you something here. Um, a, a secret I discovered, you know. Uh, somebody wrote a secret, a book called The Secret, uh, which really uh, has no secret in it. It's, it's a lot of New Age uh, stuff uh, that is not biblical in any way. If you, you have uh, that book anywhere in your house, you need to get rid of it. 
uh, don't follow its principles and its teaching. It's not biblical. Um, but <laughs> can I give you a secret? Uh, it's something that I discovered, and this is not in the secret, okay? Um, uh, when I was 12 years of age, I had my understanding um, changed uh, radically. Uh, you know, something that I discovered and it changed my life um, very, very radically. I discovered that when I was hard working at home, when I did things without complaining, comparison or competition with my brothers and sisters, uh, you know, um, when, when, when I lived what I call the ABC lifestyle, I had, I had a better life. I, I had a better attitude. I enjoyed myself. Um, I had fun. You know, I had favor with my parents. And when I did not live out the ABC lifestyle, life was more difficult. I got punished. I, I had a bad attitude. And life just sucked. And therefore, I began resolving that I need to live the ABC lifestyle. And you might be looking at me and asking me, oh, okay, Pastor, what, what is the ABC lifestyle? You know, some of you are already asking that, isn't it? Let, let me tell you, the ABC lifestyle is living above and beyond competition. Living above and beyond comparison. I, 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 I trust you're getting the ABCs. <laughs> above, beyond competition above beyond comparison, above beyond complaining. You know, as in, when I chose that when I am sent, I am not going to complain, I'm going to rise up quickly and go do what I've been asked to do. I discovered when I live that way, that life is better. So, so much better. You know, like when the Bible says that better is a little, uh, you know, with peace and all. Uh, I discovered that, that I was having a better life. Life was way, way better. When I honored my parents, when I honored my family, my brothers and sisters, you know, uh, in fact, I discovered that when I lived the ABC lifestyle, even when it comes to my brothers and sisters, they were more favorable to us. There was this time, uh, you, you know, I, uh, I, I, I confess, I, I, I was playing my brother, uh, and I, he got played. Um, I, what happened was, uh, you know, I, th those days, uh, you knew which days chapatis would be made. Uh -oh. are, are we together? Yeah. And I'm so glad that God delivered me from chapati. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but here is the thing. Here is the thing. I knew uh, that, that particular day was a day for chapatis. And so I woke up in the morning, and uh, if my brother needed, needed something, I did it for him. If you were sent somewhere, I'll be like, you know, it's okay, mom, I can go. You know? And I, I just served my brother and served my parents. And then in the evening, um, I'm meeting, I'm meeting quickly, I finished my chapati, uh, I'll not tell you how many. Uh, and then I turned to my mom and I was like, mom, I'm still hungry. And you know what? You will not believe this. My brother offered me a chapati. <laughs> He, he did. He offered me a chapati. And you know what I did? I took it. <laughs> and so it wasn't just in regard to my parents. Even with my siblings, the ABC lifestyle, they just help make life better in our interaction with one another. Life was good when I went above and beyond what I was asked to do. When I went above and beyond what was expected of me. My dad, uh, in, in fact, was more favorable towards my requests. If I, uh, and, and you see, confession is good for the soul, isn't it? If, I mean, if I, needed, if I needed more pocket money in the course of the week, I, I just ensure that over the weekend, I was his best son. And then on Sunday evening, I'll be like, Dad, um, you haven't given me money uh, for the, the week. And my dad would go into his pocket and he would give me money. That is above and beyond because I had lived above and beyond. Are you with me? Think about it. When is life better for you? When you are enjoying, uh, uh, you know, when you're complaining or when you don't? When you're busy comparing yourself to others or when you're just seeking to be who God created you to be? When, when is life better? Please tell me. 
When is your life better? When you're trying to compete and outdo others? Or when you're so settled in who you are and you're just seeking to live that life that honors and glorifies God? When is life better? Think about it. Think about it. When is your life better? When you're complaining? When you're competing? When you're comparing yourself to others? I can tell you this. If I am... If, if your life is anything like me, that's when life sucks. Isn't it? I'd like us to read from the book of Revelation chapter 3, verse number 7 to verse number 13. And as we read about this church that we are reading about today, I, I believe uh, it, it will paint a picture for us for what it takes to live the ABC lifestyle. Living above and beyond. And, and here is not just living above and beyond comparison or living above and beyond competition or comparison and all the other seeds that I can bring in there, but it's living above and beyond the call of duty. Because that's what I see in, in the church uh, at uh, uh, Philadelphia, that this church lived above and beyond the call of duty. They did not just do what was expected of them. They did not just do what they could be able to do. They lived way, way beyond this. And Jesus commends this church, praises this church, and then he gives them promises. There is no complaining. There is no, uh, you know, convicting them of anything. There is nothing that he points out and says, you need to work at this and sort out this. Philadelphia was an amazing, amazing church. And not just uh, the, because that Jesus did not, um, you know, complain about anything among them, but the fact that uh, he acknowledges, and we'll see that when we're reading that text, or we're reading, uh, if I may repeat, Revelation chapter 3, verse number 7 to 13. Uh, he acknowledges that they had little strength. That it was not possible for them to have lived the way that they lived. Yet, he, he, he just pointed out and says, amazing church. You know, I can almost picture Jesus talking about this church, and he just begins to clap. He's like, you know, the, the Philadelphia church, amazing Amazing the way you're living and the things that you're doing and the things that you're accomplishing. They were different from all the other churches. Why? I believe that they went above and beyond the call of duty. In fact, allow me to say uh, this statement and then I'll invite us to rise up on our feet even as we read the Word of God. Um, it, you know, this, this city uh, is an amazing church to uh, talk about. You know, here's a statement. I'd like you to write this and then uh, I'll ask us to do something here as we read the Word of God. It simply says, life is truly better when you seek to live your life above and beyond the call of duty. Life is truly better when you seek to live your life above and beyond the call of duty. And my prayer is that we will live this way, like the Philadelphia church. As I see Mombasa, this is, this is one church I've been praying this week, Lord, help us to be like this Philadelphia church. Help us to be like these men and women that were found in this city. It doesn't mean that there were no problems in the city. It doesn't mean that everything was smooth for them in this city. And I'll show us some of those things uh, as we talk about the, the city of Philadelphia in just a moment. But life for them was truly better when it came to uh, living their life for God. Why? Because they were seeking to live above and beyond the call of duty. I'd like to invite us to rise up on our feet as we begin the Lord God. And as we have been doing, I'll read some of the verses and then I'll let you read some of the other verses. Isn't it? That's a good thing to do. Revelation chapter 3, verse number 7, I'll begin reading. The Bible says, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? And as I said earlier, it's possible to just read that and say to the messenger of the church in Philadelphia, there are versions of the Bible that say that, or I can say to the leader of the church in Philadelphia, right? These are the words of Kim, who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. When he opens, no one can shut. And what is shut, no one can open. Verse number 8, please read. I know your deeds. See, I have eyes before you have opened the door, that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied um, Next one. I have not denied my name. Verse 9, please continue. I will make those who 
those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will let them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to take the inhabitants of the earth. All right, let me continue reading. I'm coming soon. Jesus says, hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Those are three names being written on the people. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you. You may have your seats. And so, that last verse there, just like with all the other letters, qualifies us to actually be able to study this letter and be able to capture or get the lessons uh, that are in there. The city of Philadelphia, because uh, interestingly, it still exists until today, sits near the Kogamas River. It's about 44 kilometers from the city of Sardis and 77 kilometers from the city of Laodicea. We'll be talking about Laodicea next week. And uh, we talked about Sardis last week. 77 kilometers from the city um, of Laodicea and 44 kilometers from the city of Sardis to the south, um, e uh, the, to the southeast actually of uh, the city of uh, Sardis and directly east of the city of Ephesus. In fact, the city of uh, Philadelphia was uh, sitting not just, uh, uh, you know, on the banks of the, the river Kogamas, but it was also on a highway that ran from Ephesus all the way into the interior, uh, the eastern interiors of Asia Minor and even beyond. The city uh, is located in, uh, in a valley called the Kuzuke Valley, near the bottom of Mount Bosdad in modern-day modern Turkey, uh, even today. During the days of John the Apostle, one side of the city was so fatter that uh, it was known for the wine that it produced. It was a place where a very good quality wine was produced. In fact, the wine was so good that one of the Roman poets, by the name of Vigil, wrote about its excellence. He, he did several poems just talking about the excellence of the wine that came from Philadelphia. It was a wine producing, and not just wine producing, but also wine imbibing the city. And that tells you a few things about the city, isn't it? Philadelphia was indeed a good city, with great climate, a flowing source of, of fresh water, and very rich in its produce. This city was founded in AD, uh, in BC, actually, BC 189, by Pagamon, the, the king of Pagamon, by the name of Eumenas, and um, he gave it the name um, out of honor of his brother, Atalas. And so what, what does the name of Philadelphia mean? Because he's the one who gave it the name. Uh, it simply means the city of brotherly love, or the place of brotherly love love because of just the love that he had for his brother another name that uh, uh, the city was given or people used to refer to uh, to uh, is uh, decapolis because it was considered one of the 10 cities uh, in the plains of asia minor in the first century a.d the city was transferred uh, to the, uh, the the city was referred to uh, as neo Caesarea. And this was uh, after it was transferred from uh, being controlled by the king of Asia Minor and it was given, handed over uh, to the Roman Empire. Another name uh, for this city, and this is very important for us to capture, uh, was, uh, you know, Philadelphia, the city of Brotherly Love, was called Little Athens. Little Athens. Why was it called Little Athens? Because of the pagan temples because of the pagan temples that were found in this city and the public buildings that adorned it. In other words, it was likened to the city of Athens in Greece. 
And if you remember your uh, Bible knowledge a little bit, you will, re you will remember that Athens is that place where Paul went from altar to altar until he found one altar that was dedicated to the unknown God. It was in that city. And so that begins to tell you something about this city and uh, its worship of other gods. It had so, so many pagan temples and other buildings that adorned it. The modern name of the city of Philadelphia is al -Shahir. And that is found in Turkey even today. It continues to exist. That, that's how good the location of that city was. That all these thousands of years, it still exists. In, in, in fact, uh, the name al -Shahir is said to mean the city of God. The city of God in uh, Islam. Looking at this city of brotherly love, uh, there's some things that like uh, to bring up for us uh, to capture. One is that the city was controlled by the Roman Empire, just like the other cities uh, that we have been talking about. The other thing is uh, this city of brotherly love um, faced the same challenges in regard to the worship of other gods. But yet Jesus does not rebuke the people here in any way. There is nothing he tells them that they have been tolerating. There is nothing he accuses them of. You know, regardless of the challenges, and, and we can see some of the challenges in there, because you read it, uh, there was a synagogue uh, of Satan, so to say. Uh, are, are you getting me? There were people there that Jesus would refer to that way, just like uh, what we've seen in other, some of the other churches, but there is nothing he rebukes these people of. Why? Because they lived so differently from all the other churches. There is no rebuke, no fault, no accusation. But rather he encourages them, he cheers them on, he brings them promises, things that you'd want them uh, to focus and remember. Why did Jesus do this? What was the difference uh, in this church in Philadelphia from all the other churches? Because even the city of Laodicea does not get the commendation uh, that Philadelphia gets. I believe that this church was one that constantly went above and beyond the call of duty when it came to living their lives for the living God, for honoring God, for serving God. They, they, they live for the glory of God. They did not do it for recognition. They did not do it for the show or to be seen or recognized. They did it not trying to compete or do anyone else, but they did it because they wanted to honor and glorify God. They went above and beyond the call of duty. And I can confidently say to us, as I look at this church, I, I can say to us, uh, you know, life is truly better when we seek to live our lives above and beyond the call of duty. I'd like us to look very specifically at some of the verses that we have already read and then pick up our lessons from there uh, for uh, someone today, for our time today in the Word of God. Very, very keenly looking at the verses and cleaning some truths in there. Verse number 8 is the first one that I'd like us to, uh, to look at. And as we turn to verse number 8, uh, in verse number 7, Jesus tells them uh, that uh, he is the one who opens, the, who has a key of David. Whatever door he opens, no one can close. And whatever door he closes, no one can open. You know, in essence, he was simply declaring to them, I am the Messiah. I am the one that was to come. And I did. And I have the authority. You know, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All power. Not some power. But all power has been given to me. And so the Messiah stands and tells his church, whatever door I open, no one can close. And whatever door I close, no one can be able to open. And he, in verse number 8, he says, I know your deeds. Just like he has told the other churches, I know your deeds. He tells them, I know your deeds. I know where you have been. I know your stuff. I know what your life is about. I know things that you, have, you, you involve yourself in. But he, there is such a strong uh, you know, commendation in what he says after that. Because he says, see, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. Why have I done that? Why have I placed before you an open door that no one will be able to shut? He goes on to tell them the reason. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. You have kept my word and you have not denied my name. Here is the thing. Can I give it to you? Point number one. Faithfulness and obedience opens doors that cannot be shut. 
Did you hear me? Faithfulness and obedience opens doors that cannot be shut. Jesus tells us, you, you, have, you, you have not denied my name. You have little strength. And, 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 and that, that, that phrase right there, little strength, carries with it a lot of weight and meaning. Because if they had little strength, that means that really you would not expect them to be able to stay faithful and obedient. They had little strength. When opposed, when, when, when challenges came their way, they should have given up and, and they were facing the same difficulties all the other churches were facing. How do I know this? He says, you do not deny my name. That means there are challenges and situations and circumstances that came their way that would have caused them to deny his name. There are things that happened to them that would have caused them to deny his name, but they did not deny his name. And Jesus, you know, I believe he's seated on the throne and, and he looks down and he's like, you know what, I need to go down there and I need to commend this church because even though they have little strength, they have held on, they have avoided and overcome the temptations, they have not given in to the challenges and situations that have come their way they have kept the faith they have run the race what an amazing amazing church they were weak but they did not fail they stayed faithful and obedient to Christ and I say to us faithfulness and obedience opens doors that no one can shut because Jesus says I've opened a door for you that no one can shut that it doesn't matter what happens, it doesn't matter who comes against you, this door cannot be shut. And as I said earlier, the language used in this verse means that there was trouble. The challenges were there, the difficulties were there, just like all the other churches. I mean, this city was called Little Athens because of the temples to other gods. And I can assure you, they, they were opposed, they were fought, yes. In fact, think about it. It was a wine-producing city. Guys have taken, and, and, and one of the frames of Philadelphia was, uh, and, and, uh, and, and this is a twist, actually, to, to, to this whole situation. When people talk about brotherly love, here is where it comes from. Because one of the things that they used to do in this city is that they would get so drunk that they would begin sleeping one with another without care, whether it's men and men, men and women, you know, and... and it's where, uh, if, if you use that phrase, brotherly love, in this day and age, it, it's where that connotation of homosexuality comes from. And so it was a wicked city. You see, it's very easy to read and assume that this was a perfect city, that it was better than all the other cities. No. No, 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 no. It's just that these people, even though they had little strength, even though they were weak, even though, uh, you know, because Jesus doesn't tell them that they have the abilities that the other churches had. I mean, their churches he rebukes because of their abilities that they did not use. But this church is telling them, you had little strength, but you stayed. You, you avoided, uh, you know, the, 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 the sin. You, you, you overcame the temptation. You, tol you did not tolerate opposition. You actually rose above it. You did more than what I expected of you. And I stand here today and I declare, if the city of Philadelphia, the church in the city was able to do this, then the scriptures are true. It's not by power, it's not by might, it's by the Spirit of the Lord. When He comes upon you, He will enable you to be able to live faithfully and serve God and live for God all the days of your life. And God will open a door that no one can shut. Amen. I pray, I see see Mombasa that will be like the Philadelphia church. That will be faithful and obedient to God's word. Who will be faithful to the written word of God. Who will be faithful to the lemma. That, that, that word that God gives you about a situation. When he leads you in a direction. Regardless of what you face. Regardless of what comes against you. That you will stay faithful to the Lord. In every situation. Walk in obedience you know, for the rest of your life. I pray that you will be faithful. And as you do that. My prayer is God open doors. For these men and women. That cannot be shut by anything. Even when we are weak, because sometimes we find ourselves in that place. Even when we have little strength, even when things are coming against us that we are not able to bear. I pray that God will help us to stay faithful and obedient. Because when we do, God will open a door. He'll open a door of favor. He'll open a door of provision. He'll open a door of the leading of His Spirit. He will make His face to shine upon you and fulfill His purposes in our lives. Lord, I pray that you may do it. 
as individuals, you may do it for us as a church. I pray that God Almighty, even though we have little strength, that you help us to do so much more for your kingdom in this city, that God will shine your light and will help many to come to know you as their Lord and Savior. We may not have the facilities, we may not have the budget like other churches, oh God, but we are not in competition with anyone. I pray that you help us to go above and beyond the call of duty in being faithful and obedient to you, Jehovah God. Help us, my Lord. Lead us by your spirit. Help us to make an impact for your kingdom here. Help us, Jehovah God, to go through the door that you've opened before us so that we may teach and minister and lead many to righteousness, Jehovah God. Shine your light in this city. Lead many into your very presence, Jehovah God. I pray, my Father, that no cost will be too much for us. That the Lord will depend upon you and trust you to do your work in our lives. Help us, Father, to be able to do worship on the gates this year. Help us, Father, to shine your light in this city. Help us Jehovah Father to reach out to government whether it be country or national. Help us Jehovah Father to reach out to businesses and, and the men and women of our city and to point them to you because that's the door that you've opened for us oh Lord. I pray that you'll open door for businesses. I pray that you'll bless these men in their businesses and these women. Bless them Lord so abundantly that they will sit back and say surely this is a door that God has opened. It's got nothing to do with me. I pray that God you open doors. Doors of influence in the workplace. Doors of influence and impact to the God in our city. It's my prayer. Lord help us to live faithfully and as we do so open the doors. May the Lord open the doors for you. Amen. So that you may make the impact that you ought to make. Amen? Amen? Look at the person next to you and tell them life is truly better when you seek to live your life above and beyond the call of duty. Amen. Quickly turn to the other person on the other side and tell them the same thing. Life is truly better when you seek to live your life above and beyond the call of duty. Amen. 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 Faithfulness and obedience opens a door that cannot be shut. Yes. Opens doors that cannot be shut. Jesus, the Messiah, he says, I've set a door before you that no one can shut. And I pray that your employee, your boss will not be able to shut that door. Amen. That your competitors and those who oppose you and stand against you will not be able, that no one will be able to shut the doors that God opens for you. Amen. 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 May that be your heritage. May that be God's working in your life. Amen. Verse number 9 and 10. Verse number 9 and 10. Let me, let me show you something in the word of God here. It says, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. I mean, that, that's amazing. Isn't it? Allow me to say this very quickly. Who are these that were liars who are saying they're Jews and they're not? You see, that there was a move, and you can read this in the book of Galatians, you can read this in, in, in Paul's uh, epistles, uh, you know, that there were people that were coming and beginning to say, for you to truly be a Christian, you need to uh, be, become a Jew. You need to begin practicing circumcision and, and, and living according to the law so that you can become a good Christian. And so there was that whole move. And a lot of Christians, by the way, began turning and, and, and trusting. Um, you know, remember the word of Paul uh, to, to the Galatian church. He told them, who has bewitched you? That you began in the spirit and now you're ending in the flesh. You began by trusting in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And the Spirit of God began to work miracles, signs and wonders in your midst. And then you came to the place where you began to think that you have a relationship with God because of the things that you do. It's not about the things that you do. It's about what God has done for you. But there were a lot of people that began to, to turn to, to, to Judaism, assu uh, uh, Judaism, assuming that it was making them better as believers. And so here they are. They have all these standards of righteousness where they are saying, you know, if you don't do this, if you don't do this, if you don't do this, then, then you're not good enough. You're not a believer. And Jesus shows up and says, those people, those people are of the synagogue of Satan. Why, why would he use such harsh words? Because here is the thing. Here is the thing. Think about it. I'd like you to think about this. The Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And what happens when, when you come to the place where you assume that it's a certain set of rules and, and, and standards that help us to become Christian? What happens? You begin to accuse everyone else who is not doing what you're doing. And so you become of the religion of the devil. 
you, you, you begin accusing people. And sometimes, uh, you, you see, the devil is a thief. Sometimes he actually creeps into, into churches and begins to tell people the same thing. And, and, and I know this can be controversial, but let me say, you see, it's not the length of your scalp that determines whether you're born again or not. It don't, it's not how many earrings you have in your ears. Hello? It's not how your hair looks like. I told you last week, I believe it was last week, of the guy that I met in the slums of Bokuru, Kwa Ruben, something God, honoring God, leading people to faith in amazing ways, and he had green hair. I mean, he had dyed his hair green. In my, in my Christianese mindset, that wasn't, he wasn't saved properly. But he was doing so much more than what I had ever done. And it was so, it was so rebuking to come to the place of realizing that, that, that I need to just peel away my, 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 my Judaistic, uh, if, if I would use that phrase, that word, uh, you know, my, my religiosity to, to think that one person qualifies and another one doesn't qualify. Because it's never about the way you dress. It's never about even the way you talk. All right? I don't know about you, but when, when I got saved um, in, in the late 80s, early 90s, I mean, people who spoke Shang, we didn't think they were saved properly. <laughs> I remember hearing a preacher preach action and saying that, that uh, if, if people who are uh, who, who speak Shem who are saved properly, then the Bible would have been written in Shem. I mean, can you imagine? That, 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 was, that was a way of, uh, of, of putting some people off. You see, the moment you begin to set your own rules and standards that people have to live by, okay, you are joining the accuser of the brethren. And you walk around with a is it a spiritual meter or, or a civil meter you, yeah. you're measuring? You're like, ah, you're not born again properly. Ah, Mr. Slatton, I love Misha. You know, I'm Jose Amijaribo. It's ridiculous, isn't it? And so there were people like that in Philadelphia. And Jesus calls them of the synagogue of Satan. The synagogue of Satan. When you're judging people when you're gossiping about people, when you're trying to put people down, you've joined the accuser of the brethren. Anyone who is happy just being part of the synagogue of Satan, just raise up your hand. I'd like to see and uh, maybe do what Paul says, release you <laughs> to Satan. <laughs> We will not be of that synagogue, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You go ahead and just confess and say, I will not be of the synagogue of Satan. I will not be of the synagogue of Satan. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. My, my point is simple. I've said a lot of things. Let me just tell you this. Number two. Faithfulness and obedience brings us protection. And blessing. Faithfulness and obedience brings us protection and blessings. In those two verses, Jesus repeats the same thought. I am the one who will protect you from the accusations and everything that those of the synagogue of Satan, those liars, the father of all lies, has managed to make them uh, just like him. I, I, I'm the one who protect you from their lies. I, I, I will bring them to you and they will acknowledge that I love you. They have said that you, I, I don't. They have said all kinds of things about me, but they, I will cause them to acknowledge that I love you. And I'm the one who's going to do it. You know, you will not need to go and tell them, hey, God, God loves us. No, I'm the one who will defend and, 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 and protect you and fight for you. And not only that, there is an hour coming of, of persecution and difficulty and challenge around the world. But I, I will protect you. I will be on your side. 
And so Jesus promises the church of Philadelphia that he will, uh, he will protect them. He will take care of them, regardless of what they are facing and what they are going through. And he will do this because they have been faithful and obedient. They obeyed his command and they persevered. They held on and did not give in or give up. Because of this, Jesus promises to protect them. And the same promise is also to us. We need to claim it in our faithfulness to God, in our obedience, in choosing to persevere. Even uh, when we find ourselves facing difficulties and all, don't give up, don't give in, don't walk away, don't quit. Stay at the place of faithfulness and God will fight for you. You know, when, when pain comes your way, when there are difficulties of all kinds coming your way, when it's gruesome and you feel like all you can do, remember, they had little strength. When it feels that all you can do is give in, my friend, don't. Keep in. Stay faithful. Hold on to God. And let him be the one that fights on your behalf. The one that leads you forward. The one that takes care of you in every way. The Lord promises to protect you. And I pray today that God will protect you. That he will watch over you in your workplace. That he will watch over you in your neighborhood. In your homes. In your village. Wherever it is that you come from. That God will watch over you. And protect you. And that he will cause his name to be upon you. So that people may acknowledge that indeed he loves you. Oh God I pray. Would you protect your people. Would you watch over, the, over them. Some of them, Lord, might be going through such difficulties and situations of all kinds, my Father. Whether it be sickness or disease or just pain that, that has been there. Pain of frustration and disappointments and, and, and not being able, Father, to uh, lead the kind of life that they would dream and desire. I pray today, protect your people. Watch over them, Jehovah. Even when the enemy comes in like a flood, you say you raise a standard by your spirit. Do it, oh God. <coughs> Because life is truly better when we seek to live our lives above and beyond the call of duty. I pray that Father will push ourselves to a place of faithfulness and obedience beyond anything that people would expect. Help us to honor you, Lord. Help us to live for you. For I pray that God will protect every one of these men and women. Protect them from gossip and accusations. Protect them, Jehovah Father, from the fiery darts of the evil one. Protect us. And help us to live for you. Child's faithfulness and obedience brings us protection and God's blessing. I upon you. Amen. That God's favor will be upon you. Because that's a blessing that, that, that was right there. That, that he said, I will bring the people to you and I will cause them to know that I love you. You see, God says that those who serve him, he will cause there to be a distinction between them and those who do not. That people will look at you and say, there's something different about you. May it be said of you that there's something different about you in your workplace, in the estate where you live, whatever it is that you go. May there be such a blessing of the Lord upon you that it deals and, and, and just takes away anything that the enemy will try to do against you. And number three, and I am done. Verse number 11 and 12. I'd like to read this very quickly. And uh, we are done. Uh, because, uh, really, uh, uh, can I read verse 10 and then come all the way? Um, here it is. It says, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Verse number 12, the Bible says, The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Wow, that's powerful. I will make them a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write to them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God and uh, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Amen. Wow, there will be such distinction. But allow me to say this way. Faithfulness and obedience result in establishment and reward. Result in establishment and reward. Jesus promises the church of Philadelphia that he will establish them as pillars will reward them by writing his name upon them because of their faithfulness and obedience to him. The victorious, the faithful and obedient, he will make them pillars in the temple. And you and I need to be set and established in God's temple, in God's purposes, in God's will, in God's plans, in God's ways. We need to be faithful and obedient for that to be able to happen. Faithful and obedient. You see, faithfulness talks about a commitment to God that refuses to budge regardless of the opposition and the difficulties that you face. 
and obedience here is not based on what everyone else is doing. It's, it's going beyond what everyone else is doing. You don't live like everyone else. You begin to live the life that God desires for you to live. There's no second guessing of ourselves, no selling out or giving up, but staying with the Lord, obeying God even when it does not make sense, following His guidance even when it costs us everything, and staying true to the very end. It's refusing to bribe when everyone else is expecting you to do so. It's refusing to cut corners when people are telling you, but this is the way it's done. Staying true to that which God desires of you. I pray that God may establish you. Establish your business, establish your career, establish you in the purposes that he has for you. You see, God is building his church. He's building his purposes in this city, in this nation, and even beyond. And I pray that he will cause you to be a pillar right there. Because as you walk in obedience to the things that God desires, you're, you're actually being built up stone by stone into all that God wants of you. May you be established as a pillar in God's work in our city and in our nation and beyond. May your business be established as a pillar in God's purposes. That when God thinks or, or, or desires to provide, for example, for the cost of, of, of the building of his temple, that he actually picks you up. And remember the king, king Cyrus, the way God says, I will raise King Cyrus for the use of, in rebuilding my temple. He was, he was a pagan king, so to say, but God raised him up and used him as a pillar to accomplish his purposes. I pray that God will set you up and use you as a pillar. Not, not because he has chosen you, regardless of how you live, but because of your faithfulness and your obedience. That God will choose you, that God will pick you, that God will boast about you like he did of Job. Even to the devil, you know, have you seen my servant Job? That's what he asked. May heaven and earth know, and even hell, because even Satan went to hell, um, knowing that Job is God's servant. May it be known everywhere. May the genies of Mombasa know that you are established as a pillar in God's purpose. May men and women in our city know that you are established. You're a pillar. Why? Because of your faithfulness and obedience to God. The Bible says when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. May God so establish you because of your faithfulness and obedience to him that your ways please him in every way. Amen? Amen. This is my prayer. Let us live in faithfulness and obedience. In faithfulness and obedience. There is a pledge I'd like us to make and then we'll be done. Something that we made at the Afleo night of, of worship. We we'll just go ahead and pull that up. Because I'd like us to make this um, pledge, this commitment. Because uh, as I was completing with someone, that's what the Lord reminded me of. Some of you are there, some of you made that pledge. I'd like us to, to, to just make that pledge. It's a declaration, actually, of just how we're going to live our lives and the things that we will pursue. Because I am praying that as we commit ourselves to live for God, to be faithful and obedient in every way, that God will do a work upon us that will be so unique and so special. All the days of our lives, you can pull it up from our Facebook page or the Apple page. I will be faithful. We will honor God. Because life is truly better when you seek to live your life above and beyond the call of duty. When you pursue the things that God wants you to pursue. When you go after the things that God wants you to go after. As you commit yourself to live that way. As you commit yourself to honor God as you commit yourself to live in obedience, that God will be honored in you and through you. Heavenly Father, it's my prayer for myself, for these men and women, that He will help us like the people of Philadelphia, that will not look at ourselves and, and say, I am of little strength or I don't have much or I'm not able. 
to do this, I'm not able to live this way. But that Father will commit ourselves to seek after you and pursue you. We will commit ourselves to our God, to your purposes, to your ways, to your will. And our lives will be impacted and transformed and changed by your presence. Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, I pray that you will show us the places where we have been failing, the places where we have not lived in obedience, the places where we have not stayed faithful. And as we begin to deal with this, Lord, would you transform and change us? As a church, I pray that, Father, there will be such a level of obedience and faithfulness to your purposes and to your calling that, Lord God Almighty, you will be honored in all that we do. This is my prayer, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Work this, do this, glorify yourself in us. For you alone are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You alone are sovereign, you alone are holy. You alone are holy. You're here and you would say, you know, our pastor, I've not lived a life of obedience and faithfulness to God. Even though I'm born again, I cut corners, I have been involved in practices that I shouldn't. This can be just living a lifestyle of sin or, or just cutting corners at your workplace. It doesn't matter. You, there is that conviction of the Holy Spirit upon you. I'd like you to go ahead and just raise up your hand at this moment. Let me pray with you before I lead us in the declaration. Is there anyone like that who would say, you know what, Pastor, sincerely speaking, I've not lived a life of obedience and faithfulness. And I need you to pray together with me. Thank you. Anyone else? Just raise up your hand. I'd like to pray together with you at this point. Thank you for your hand. Anyone else who would say, yes, I've got to me. And I need God to change me and help me to live a life of obedience and faithfulness from here going forward. Heavenly Father, I pray with the men and women that are lifting up their hands. It's my prayer that, Father, you will forgive them and wash them in your blood. And that you will not hold these against them, but you will help them to live for you. You will help them to serve you. You will help them to have a God to stay obedient and <coughs> To the things that you've called them to, oh God. That they will, as we said earlier, they will stay faithful and obedient, Lord, to your word, whether it be the spoken word, the revel word of God, or whether it be the written word of God. I pray that we'll be faithful to this. They will be faithful to the things that you call them to. And even though they have little strength, that God you will help them to know that it doesn't matter the strength. You have called them, you desire them to, to, to live for you, to serve you, and to walk in your ways, Jehovah God, and that they will do so. They will do so. And glorify you in every area of their lives. By your Holy Spirit, empower them. By your Holy Spirit, equip them. By your Holy Spirit, Lord, fill them with all that they need to be all that you desire for your kingdom purposes. But this is my prayer. In Jesus' name. And everyone say Amen. 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 All right, church, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you, give you his peace. May the Lord surround you with his presence and guide you by his spirit. Amen.